it is 6.34 p.m. Um, on Tuesday, April 8th, 2021. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Christian Klein. I'm the chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. I'm calling this meeting of the board to order. To confirm that all members and anticipated officials are present. Uh, so members of the Zoning Board of Appeals, Roger DuPont. Here. Patrick Hanlon. He's mute. How do you unmute? He's on mute. Ah. Kevin Mills? Here. Uh, Sean O'Rourke? Here. Aaron Ford? Here. Stephen Revelack? Here. Okay. Um, officials here from the town. Uh, Vincent Lee? Yep. Uh, Mr. Valarelli is away this week. Um, I believe Emily Sullivan is on. Here. If there are any other officials for the town, Mr. DeCourcy is here from the Board of Selectmen, I see. Um, but I don't see other town officials. Um, is Paul Haverty on? I don't see Paul. Um, I don't believe Marty Nover is joining us tonight, but um, I believe I saw Greg Lucas is here. I am here. Um, and Stephanie Kiefer is here on behalf of the applicant. Yep, she is. Um, and so Gwen Noyce is here for the applicant. Is Are there others joining as well? I look for John's name. I don't see him in the list. Oh, there he is. No, he is here. Yeah. Oh, perfect. All right. So I will keep an eye out for Mr. Haverty. He, he, he's the one person who's not here. Okay. This open meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020. The order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. Public bodies may meet remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. An opportunity for public participation will be provided during the public comment period during each public hearing. For this meeting, the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals has convened a video conference via the Zoom app with online and telephone access as listed on the agenda posted to the town's website identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and is being broadcast by ACMI. Please be aware that attendees are participating by a variety of means. Some attendees are participating by video conference. Other participants are participating by computer audio or telephone. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you, your screen name, or another identifier. Please take care to not share personal information. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. We ask you to please maintain decorum during the meeting, including displaying an appropriate background. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website, unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. 
As chair, I reserve the right to take items out of order in the interest of promoting an orderly meeting. <clears throat> so the, the sole item on the agenda this evening is the comprehensive permit hearing for the continuation of the con comprehensive permit hearing for Thorndike Place. I want to just quickly review some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of tonight's business. Discussion will primarily involve the proposed draft decision and related topics. Um, the, the draft decision was initially released on Wednesday, March 10th, and there was an update issued today um, that came out uh, later this afternoon. So um, we're concentrating, I think, more on the, the earlier um, draft, but we would like to, to open the conversation on some of the changes. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So initially, the um, the 180 day hearing period for this hearing was to expire tomorrow, April 9th. That has been um, extended by 14 days to um, April 23rd. Uh, so that is the new uh, the new end date for the public hearing. Um, so the, the main thing that has um, sort of transpired in the in the meantime was on on March 8th, the applicant filed a notice of project revision with Mass Housing, which detailed the, the changes to the project since it was initially filed um, with Mass Housing. On March 12th, uh, the Zoning Board of Appeals requested an expedited review by Mass Housing of that application. Um, on uh, March 15th, the Select Board um, issued comments to Mass Housing in regards to the notice of project revision. On Monday, March 22nd, uh, Mass Housing held a conference call with uh, members of the of the town to discuss the application uh, and, the, and the notice of project revision. And on the, the following day on March 23rd, Mass Housing issued their formal response. Um, and in their formal response, they noted that the changes were not substantial for 760 CMR 56045, which is the, the governing legislation for a determination of product revision and whether it is substantial. Um, and they found that the current review process is the proper venue for us to discuss all matters of local concern. And Mass Housing noted that they will review the final plans once the project returns to Mass Housing for final approval. Um, and so that is the <clears throat> So that, that is the, the sort of the full circle um, with Mass Housing on the question of the, the project revision and whether the changes were substantial. So that um, so the next item on the agenda. Um, so one of the items that the select board has been very um, very vocal about is and that the a lot of the neighbors have been requesting is the issue of the oh, Mr. Haverty, um, is the question of the the duplex houses that were initially that were part of the initial application um, that were removed as a part of the revision when the main body of the apartment block was brought out to Dorothy Road and the after the all the, the public input we've had and the, the input from the select board um, on behalf of the board, would like to uh, raise this question with the applicant um, as to whether the applicant would be would consider putting the duplex houses back into the project as a buffer between Dorothy Road and a larger apartment building that would be that would occur behind it. Now, obviously, one of the considerations that has come that came about um, and was one of the driving reasons for the um, the revision, I believe, was the is the position of the wetlands um, immediately behind the building and the determination of of wetlands that are in the immediate area. And so, had wanted to sort of open this question with the applicant <clears throat> as to you know would the applicant be willing to um, have a discussion about putting the the duplex houses back into the program um, as a buffer between Dorothy Road 
and an apartment block. And if we were to, if they were to entertain that, what would the implications be for an apartment block that would occur behind it? And is it is this a feasible? Is this is this feasible enough that we should we should do a more deep dive into it? Um, and so I had had a <coughs> excuse me. A brief conversation earlier today um, with attorney Kiefer in regards to that, you know, to, to let her know that this was something that the board um, was considering discussing. And so um, I would like to, to formally ask that question of Ms. Kiefer at this time as to whether that's something she thinks that the applicant would be willing to, to discuss with the board. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, can you hear me okay? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Um, and as you just mentioned, we had uh, briefly discussed this probably five minutes ago. Um, and, and, you know, on, on that vein, um, and, and the project where we are today and how it's been designed, um, I, I do want to point out that um, she, since about September of, of 2020, the applicant started to refine and revise the project and um, you know, as updated, um, you know, throughout the coming months in the public hearings. And, and just to clarify, the multifamily building, as it's designed right now and, and its most recent modification, um, the, the front um, wings, what we're calling it, or some people may call them tabs, of the building um, essentially somewhat, somewhat currently mimic the, um, the, the houses or the townhouses on the opposite. You have one that's almost like a double lot and then you have two wings that come out to this um, north central part and then the northeasterly part that are, are um, largely, you know, of the width of the townhouses across the street. Um, and, and those three wings are only at two, two stories tall. Um, the, the initial proposal actually with the townhouses when this was submitted, um, just as a reminder, those townhouses were two and a half stories, so about 32 feet high. Um, and I, I think that it's it's very um, difficult at this juncture to give you a, um, a, a suitable response as to whether the applicant will consider that um, without further information and feedback from the board. So if the board can provide that this evening, we can more intelligently think about this um, because to, to look at a, a revision now very, this very late in the process, obviously, is is very significant. And um, some of the questions that would come to my mind that I think would help inform the applicant in making its decision is, um, you know, if, if there's an introduction of townhouses um, and there's a, a building behind it, um, what is the board's thought on, um, this is a PUD zoning. So under the PUD zoning district, um, there's actually allowed five floors of residential, as you know, under the zoning bylaw. Um, is, is the board contemplating that if, if there's a revised multifamily building behind town, townhomes that um, it be permitted to go up five floors? Um, and, and, and otherwise, what are the thoughts in terms of, as you had mentioned, um, the, with the removal of the townhomes and the multifamily building who, being moved closer to the road, um, it likewise had the, um, the the benefit of being farther away um, from um, BBW, isolated wetlands, um, limited limited impacts into the aura, and then um, really revised and, and limited the amount within the floodplain. Um, and, and so I, I think that if the board is willing to provide some feedback to the applicant tonight, so we can consider you know, what is, what is the board envisioning? Not, not that it will necessarily make our determination easier in terms of whether we're willing and what it would look like, but I think that um, the question in a vacuum is super difficult to understand until there's some feedback from the board and we would really appreciate that. Absolutely, thank you. <clears throat> um, So I think I'd like to sort of start off this conversation with the board. Um, so I know this is something that has been mentioned many times by the um, by the residents and by others in town as to whether um, 
you know, it, about what the what the duplex houses brought to the project, and that in the initial design, the townhomes were intended to and were portrayed as for providing a buffer between the residential nature that's existent on Dorothy Road and sort of a larger apartment building that is not as in keeping with um, the character of the neighborhood, but would provide um, sort of the, the level of housing that would make a project such as this um, be viable. Um, and so obviously the there are many concerns in this neighborhood in regards to um, to different issues. Um, one being the sort of the, the massing of the building and the way it relates to the to the residents, but also having to do with the wetlands and the, the water issues on site, and also issues revolving around transportation and access to the site. So the, the board has been working on this balancing act uh, for, for quite a while, and the applicant has, has as well, to try to come up with something where we're able to, to, to balance all these needs, which is what the, the 40B process is intended to um, intended to, to have. So at this stage, you know, we, we have gone down, um, you know, one direction fairly considerably. And so in, as, as Ms. Keeper noted, it is a little late in the process, but I think it's incumbent upon us to really vet all possible options. And this is certainly an option that many members of the, of the neighborhood have expressed an interest in and, um, Certain members of, of the of the, the town have expressed as well, and so just want to sort of talk with the board <clears throat> in regards to the to how this might impact the wet. The, so how this might impact the wetlands, I think, is a is a really critical critical piece because the the current proposal really has gotten to the point where is essentially compliant with local wetlands bylaw. And if we were to, um, to encourage a strong look at this, um, is there, what, what is the board's sense in regards to the, to the wetlands impact? Is, the, is it better to have townhomes um, and have to revisit the question of wetlands or do we really only want to, do we want to discuss townhomes, keeping the wetlands as they are currently, um, you know, to the as, as we have them today? Because there's there are really so many different issues that need to come together. So, um, open this question to the to the board, um, Mr. Revelak. Yeah. So I'm I've been now. Unfortunately, I don't have a set of plans in front of me, so I'm just trying to visualize this from memory. Um, I mean, personally, I completely understand. I, I readily admit this is a late, it is late in the game, but, and I am very happy, you know, from you know, the negotiations that have been ongoing that we have gotten the project nearly in compliance with lo local wetland bylaws. So I would, now, if we were to, you know, bring the townhouse, the six townhouse homes back. It was six duplex units. Is that is that correct? That was in the initial proposal, the, mm -hmm. but I think we would be, we would need to entertain what that number might be. Okay, to so I could see that eating in so the just spatially, um, it would be preferable not to move the main building back, in my opinion, uh, because of the wetlands impacts. Um, I understand that uh, adding townhomes in front would take away space from the building. So I think the the trade off that we're making is, you know, potentially, you know, the townhomes, a taller main building to make up uh, the difference in units, potentially, uh, as Ms. Kiefer said, there, we do allow five stories of reg residential in the planned unit development district, and they could do that without a waiver and then minimize the um you know 
and the other trade off on the back end of the building is the wetland impact. So it's just, you know, there's, there's, there's a, tu I, I'm just trying to say that there is a tug of, you know, there's a get, there is, there are balances to be made on both sides of the building, but I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not opposed to the idea of, you know, say bringing back some of the townhouses and going up, you know, to adding a fifth story on the main building and minimizing the distance that the main building has to move back. Chairman? Yes. Um, well, I, of course, the question has come up overtly just now about what to do about the townhouses, uh, but the conflict between neighborhood compatibility and protecting the wetlands and guarding against flooding has been, the, has been there all along. And this has always been the elephant in the room. The difficulty is that you can't, but you can't protect the wetlands and do everything that has been accomplished since November on the respect to flooding, and provide for neighborhood compatibility if the project main, remains the size it is. Uh, so it's not just a matter of say, let's take as a given that the project is going to be essentially the way it is right now. And where do we want to make the sacrifices? This is a balance that needs to be a three-way balance. And I think that while I agree with Mr. Revelak, I'd be willing to contemplate uh, a design that uh, is attempts to, to, to save as much as uh, the applicant can of of the size of the project. There's no point in trying to make it a smaller project just to make it a smaller project. Nevertheless, it has to come into some kind of a balance. And I would not be willing to compromise on the water side of that balance. We've made it, this project has come a long way uh, in protecting wetlands, in, in guarding against flooding. It wouldn't satisfy everyone, but it has really come a long way. And those are really important achievements and they're not achievements that we should put on the negotiating block now. So the issue to me is whether or not the applicant is able within what they're willing to contemplate to work with us in order on a design uh, that whether it involves the townhouses or whether there's other alternatives to reducing the mass because it's I don't want to sort of assume that the solution has to be of one kind. But basically, the impact now on neighborhood compatibility is too much, and it has to be reduced and not reduced at the expense of the wetlands and, and the flooding. That could conceivably involve uh, more height further back. I wouldn't exclude that, uh, but I think that it's fair to say that any solution to this problem is likely to involve a somewhat uh, less massive, uh, a less massive building than is proposed now. Thank you. Mr. Mills. Yes, thank you for this opportunity. Um, I feel putting the townhouses back in would be very good for the neighborhood. Um, those three piers fronting Dorothy Street, I really don't feel replicate the feel of uh, a home or a townhouse. I do believe one of those piers is about 110 feet long, which is about three lots wide, you know, edge to edge, which is a pretty imposing edifice. Uh, I would like to see if we could put the townhouses back in and there may be a reduced front footprint available out back due to the wetlands but I would have no problem myself allowing it to go up to five stories. Intuitively, I feel if you move that building farther away from Dorothy Road, uh, the water that naturally drains towards Elwife Brook would have more of a chance of going around that foundation and away from the local houses. I feel that foundation is gonna be like a dam holding the groundwater in that neighborhood. And the farther you can move it towards the Elway Brook, in my opinion, and I'm not a hydrologist, but just intuitively, I would think it will be better for the neighbors. But I think certainly the transition of having townhouses 
and not a huge apartment house uh, right on their block would be more appealing to the locals. And I think that's the least we can do for them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mills. The members of the board. Not the time. Um, so I would, um, so asking a question of John Hessian. Um, so, John, based on you know your knowledge of this site and uh, and the, the considerable work you have done um, in developing the, the current project as it cited. What is your sense of um, available space on that is developable that's outside the the wetlands as it is sort of designated right now? Do you have any sense as to whether there is developable space to have both a series of, of duplex houses on Dorothy Road and an apartment block behind? Um, Mr. Chair, yeah. Hey, again, would just a you know a, a few minutes to really kind of think about this or or consider it um without being able to identify that what potentially the total number of units would be i think there is the potential to reintroduce to townhomes um what that would require on the existing multifamily building is the elimination, likely the elimination of the uh, three wings that um, extend towards Dorothy. So the townhomes would essentially take the place of those three wings. Um, and then the, the main spine, the east-west spine of the building would likely need to slide a little bit further to the south. And from what I heard from, um, you know, all, all three uh, board members that spoke was that, you know, they, they didn't want to see us go kind of backwards with respect to protecting the wetlands. So it would also likely mean, you know, shortening up the three wings on the south side of the main spine to essentially stay within the, within a, a similar, I'd call it building envelope as the existing or the, the current multifamily building that's before the board uh, presently is within. So maintaining, you know, similar, you know, wetland setbacks, uh, similar floodplain um, impacts, um, but then, so the units lost, it would be, this is where, you know, the architects will need to, <laughs> Um, weigh in the units lost with the elimination or reduction in those kind of north-south wings, um, how much of that could be made back up um, with the addition of a, of a fifth floor on that, on that multifamily building. But um, conceptually, I, I believe something along those lines um, could work, whether it's, you know, viable for the overall project. I, I can't really answer that till we, we do a little bit more, um, you know, design and, and programming. Yeah. Mr. Revlack? Yes, just um, going back to the uh, to the to the duplexes in front, which we've been calling townhomes. Um, I'm kind. I would also wonder if you know, and I'm I'm cog, you know, and I'm you know trying to just um, think of ways to balance out the unit count among the different buildings. Um, if possibly consideration could be given to not necessarily, you know duplexes, but actually a row of townhomes. Um, just, you know, be basically, you know, eliminating some of the space in between the buildings to get a few more units in to, uh, to sort of make up the difference from what would be lost from the main multifamily building. Uh, 
my because sort of what you're what you're getting to with that is sort of the the term townhomes is really more um, it's a series of individual buildings that are stacked immediately adjacent to each other um, with a width somewhere in the 25 to 28 usually they're somewhere between 25 and 30 feet wide they're stacked against each other so there's there they are a more consistent frontage um, mm -hmm. but they are a series of individual homes rather than duplexes which is sort of the, the prevalent um, building style of directly across the street where it's two residences that are side by side um, with a with a party wall in between. Mm -hmm. I thought it was Kiefer, you were, I believe you had your hand up. I was just wondering if I could ask for a clarification from Mr. Ravalak and Absolutely. what what he was envisioning there just so I, 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 I wasn't quite certain. Were, were you suggesting that these series go like lots a lot so you know, some what you might see like in brownstones in the city, or or I, I wasn't quite certain what you were. That is exactly what I was suggesting. Uh, so our zoning bylaws term for this would be townhouse structure, but it would base think um, you know if if you were to think of a duplex as a multi-unit home that's two units wide, mm -hmm. a townhouse townhome or a townhouse structure is a multi-unit home that's several units wide. So basically what this would allow, potentially allow, is to take what would or ordinarily be space between uh, duplex structures and allow you to, f to infill between those. Okay, can I ask one follow-up question on that Absolutely. then? Um, what would you, and, and John, um, the, from John Hesher may want to weigh in too, just because this is somewhat more of an engineering question, but in, in terms of, would that then have a drive that accesses them from the back or would they each have drive, are you contemplating small driveways where they can then go similar to how the people across the street go for their parking underneath the buildings? Is that for me? Yeah, it was. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, so um, typically with town homes, yes, I would, I would say a yeah, small driveway to or service road to access from the rear. Mr. Chairman? Yes, please. Um, <clears throat> well, I'm not very much an expert in the construction of townhomes. I am an expert in living one, having done it for <laughs> about 20 years in both Berkeley, California, where the entrance was from the back, and Arlington, Virginia, where the entrance was from the front. Um, it's actually much more common outside the Boston area to develop along that pattern. Uh, and it can be made into a perfectly, uh, a, a perfectly, uh, I mean, it, it can come in at every, at, at every level. It's, it's not necessarily a cheap construction and it's not necessarily expensive. It is just another way um, of doing it. Um, I think that it really, it would be up to Mr. Hessian to figure out how to handle the parking. It's a, it's a potentially large problem. Um, there was no down under feature in either of the two townhouses that I lived in. One of them, you could come into a garage that faced out towards the back. The other one, you could come in through a garage that faced out towards the front, but didn't have a driveway. Um, so you have to be somewhat, or you can be quite innovative once you are in point of working out what the various implications are. And, I'm sure that Mr. Hessian and the architects, once they set their mind to it, could think of a number of different solutions to the problem. But finding a, a way of, of dealing with the parking uh, and also dealing with the potential for in, increased impervious services and so forth uh, would, be a, would be a challenge, although I don't think that that would be a challenge that's beyond the skills of the people who are involved. Mr. Chairman? Yes, please, Mr. Dubon. So I just want to express a little bit of concern here because I do understand that the conversation I, I think is really just for purposes of discussion and getting a sense as to what the possibilities might be. But I, I want to make sure that it's understood by the applicant that you know they were the ones who came initially with the 
townhome or duplex uh, plan. And as I drove down Dorothy Road again today and I looked at it, there's six structures which are, I think, in keeping with the neighborhood, 61 through 85. And it would strike me that something along those lines across the street would be the type of approach that would at least give a nod to making this fit in with the neighborhood. And the fact that the change was made somewhere a while ago, um, I don't want that to be interpreted because we weren't discussing it at the time as acquiescence on the part of the board. And I think the applicant has known that this has been an express concern of the board as well as the neighbors for a very lengthy period of time. And so when it's presented to us as, well, this is kind of late in the whole process, I do find that to be inconceivable that knowing of the preference on the part of the board, I think, and on the part of the town, the neighbors, that that has not somehow been uh, gamed out on their side of things. And so even though I hear discussions about the possibility of a taller building, I certainly want to be clear that I am not endorsing that concept. I understand that it's in discussion and it would be considered, but I think it's incumbent upon the applicant to be able to respond to the concerns that have been expressed over a lengthy period of time without us having to make concessions during the, during the discussions that we're having. So that's all I wanna say. I just, I'm not on board with anything anyone has said, but I do think that the applicant has had sufficient notice over time that this was a preference we had. And in particular, when the letter was sent out saying that we had concerns about the change. So that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Other questions for the comments from the board at this time? Ms. Keeper, do you have questions of the board? Sorry, I don't know if you heard me, Ms. Keeper. I don't know. Do you have further questions of the board or any fun from your team who has questions of the board? I don't believe I have any questions. I'll, I'll open it up to John or, or members of the team if they have any specific questions just to help us inform our consideration of this request. Um, Mr. Chair, I, I would just say that, um, you know, we'll We'll take the um, townhome concept um, shared by Mr. Revlack in, into consideration, but also Mr. DuPont's um, comments also about um, the, the townhomes or, or duplexes that were originally proposed um, are more in keeping with, um, with the two family homes directly across Dorothy Street. So we'll, you know, if, if the reintroduction, we haven't even had the chance to, you know, discuss um, as a team uh, how the team wants to proceed. But if the if the team wants to um, investigate the the opportunity to to reintroduce the townhomes, we'll take all of that into consideration to to try to develop, um, you know, a revised plan that's you know responsive to the comments we're hearing uh, this evening. Chairman. Thank you for that. Mr. Hanlon? Um, I just wanted to stress the, that uh, stress the that I, I agree completely with what Mr. DuPont said. And the conversation that, that led up to that was sort of a back and forth about various possibilities. But I don't want it to be thought that the board was sort of leaning towards one responsibility or attempting to define its own way of having the applicant Involve, resolve this problem. I mean, essentially, there is a conflict between wetlands. I think that the applicant has heard that there's a very strong endorsement of 
maintaining the progress that was made since November on that, and that you now have a big neighborhood compatibility problem that is in part the result of the earlier saving the wetlands, but it's also in part a result of the applicant's own ambitions for what they want to do here. And it's a solution that if there can be a solution, it's something that we can't tell them what it would be. And we certainly can't tell them in advance what we would accept or not accept without hearing from the public and whoever else it is. Uh, all we really can say is that we'd, in, we'd welcome engaging in a conversation about that and seeing if we can come to a better balance of these interests than the proposal we have before us. Thank you, Mr. Hanley. <clears throat> um, would like to ask um, if Ms. Noyes or Mr. Mr. Clipwell have any comments at this time. Are we uh, are we being heard at this point? This is Arthur. You are, yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Well, um, I think as as uh, Stephanie has said, you know, we'll, we'll we'll definitely take this under consideration. We're trying very hard to, you know, have a happy ending to this or as happy an ending as we can get this process. And uh, well, I think we'll very willing to go back and take a look at bringing the townhouses back along Dorothy Road. Um, and we'll just have we'll just have to look into it. So I think the you know the thing that puzzles me a little bit is how that can be handled in the process. That's one thing. How how is our process give us probably at least two or three weeks to come back with an organized thought through proposal. And I like, I like very much what John said. Uh, I think we should very much try to capture the gains we've made with the wetlands because we've done well with that. We've, we've spent a lot of time on that and I feel pretty good about that. So I don't wanna go back into something that challenges that. We should keep that and try to find a solution that keeps that, that uh, uh, advantage. Um, so I think that's an important piece. The time is an important piece. And I think one other thing just to put on the table, that a thing we did uh, when we put those townhouses originally on the, um, in the design before we were made the concessions to the wetlands by needing to go nearer to the road and, and further uh, in that direction to get uh, something that uh, avoided the wetlands, they were condominiums and that I'd like everybody just to know that that's not as easy for us as maintaining those townhouse looking pieces as part of the overall project, in other words, mm -hmm. rentals. Mm -hmm. And uh, one thing we could do, and I just put this in front of everybody, is maybe those could be the three bedroom, the required 10% three bedroom units. So maybe there's a way to do this would make our life a little easier uh, to try to stay within that wetland boundary if we had you kind of thinking about uh, number one, that those townhouse looking things could be whatever we call them, uh, would be uh, rentals. Because I think the neighborhood actually wanted them to be townhouses because we had home ownership. So that would be a little bit of a concession on uh, others' parts to let us do something that would help us make the project work. Um, so anyhow, these are all just, just things to, uh, to get on the table and think about. But I think the biggest thing is to try to establish a time frame for us to come back to you with something that uh, could could uh, move in the direction that you're mapping out for us tonight. Thank you. Um, Mr. Klippel, if I could just ask you to clarify where you, you had mentioned that um, sort of pursuing this, this front row of buildings as rental as opposed to ownership would be easier. Could you just sort of elaborate what you mean by that? Well, um, I think from a development standpoint, uh, having a mixture in your marketing effort and your ownership uh, effort uh, is very complicated. And um, it clearly couldn't be as easily a 40B. It would be very, very complicated. 
And I just, you know, we need to think about this, but I think uh, I'm just kind of raising a flag here that one of the things we may come back to, back with, is to say that this could be part of the overall project. It would be one project uh, which would have some townhouse looking things. They could be, you know, wood frames, small. They could be look exactly like the other buildings we did before. But they would be uh, structured. And I, I, you know, we can talk about that. I'm not trying to close the door on anything at this point. But I just, uh, I'm just letting you know something that we would, uh, we would probably be thinking hard about uh, in, in terms of awesome. come, taking another look at this. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate that. Thank you. At this point, um, we've had uh, several people uh, with their hands up for quite a while, waiting patiently. So I will, um, <clears throat> in a moment, I'm go ahead and open up public comment on the proposed inclusion of, of housing as, as uh, interstitial world housing as part of the proposed project. Um, so I would like to open public comment. Um, at this point, we'll, say we'll open it for 40 minutes um, until 8 p.m. Um, <clears throat> so public questions and comments will be taken on all aspects of the proposed Project should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing our decision and to provide for an orderly flow to the meeting and to allow for the inclusion of many voices. Chair would like to limit individual public speakers to three minutes each and encourage them to use their time to provide comment related to this indicated topic. If time allows, speakers will be afforded a second opportunity to speak. The chair encourages the public to provide written comments to be reviewed by the board and included in the record. This is especially true if you have specific recommendations in regards to this project. Um, Procedure for requesting to speak will be the same as for previous hearings. Please select the raise hand button on the comments tab on Zoom or dial star nine on your phone to indicate you would like to speak. When called upon, please identify yourself by name and address. You'll be given three minutes for your questions and comments. All questions are to be addressed through the chair. Please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. Once the allocated time has been expended, the public comment period for this portion of the evening's hearing will be closed. Um, Board and staff will do our best to show any documents um, that uh, people would like. We don't have any documents in front of us currently. If you would like a specific document to be pulled up, please let us know. Um, so with that, um, I believe Mr. Urowitz was the first with his hand up. Yes, thank you. My name is John Urowitz. I live at 47 Mott Street for 36 years. And we should establish one thing first. For decades, we've fought development on this site and won. Now comes along a new proposal for housing. Nothing has changed about the site. It's still wet. It's a wetland. It's treed. It's green. Nothing has changed about the neighborhood except a few people here and there. We are going to get what has been called a happy ending if nothing gets built. But we don't, we don't have that choice, it looks like. We're, we're negotiating down what was to be 172 dwellings to whatever it is now. The point I'm trying to make here is that the last transaction, the transmission that came from the state was to be from the ZBA to get an approval with restrictions. I have found that five stories is unacceptable. Putting the, putting the six townhouses back on Dorothy Road is the way to do it, but the building behind need only be three stories tall. It doesn't matter where, how far back you push it because you get wetland. My, my restrictions that I'm suggesting are the six townhouses, two egresses, Birch Street and Little John Street, and to put the six townhouses back and three stories. That brings it down to about 134 units. We can live with that. It's a restriction. If the town deems it as a restriction, that's the way it goes. Uh, from what I gather, the applicant can, can appeal things to the state, um, and, and therein lies the problem. But understand, we didn't want anything, nothing. We haven't for decades, so we don't want this. But if we have to take something, let's take it as small and as, uh, as harmless as possible. Six townhouses, three stories, two egresses. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Um, Mr. McKinnon? Hello, my name is Matt McKinnon. I live at 9 Little John Street in Arlington. Yes, sir. 
Um, I've already said my piece in previous CBA meetings, and I've written multiple letters, um, and those can be read. Uh, but I think tonight we're just discussing whether it's, um, you know, in good nature to put those townhomes back in as they were in the original submission, submittal. Uh, I agree that they should be put back in uh, with the 100% uh, owner uh, occupied. Uh, you know, this, this is a 40B application. It's all about providing affordable housing. I think uh, the way to provide affordable housing is to actually provide a way to home ownership. Um, and that can be done by putting these townhomes back in. I, uh, you know, I think the problem is that they also own this other company, Greenstacks, which is this modular company. Uh, they kind of want to just put these blocks in uh, because it's the most cost efficient way to do it. Um, I'm afraid they kind of want to stick these blocks right, you know, as townhomes. Uh, and I don't think that's the way to go. I think we need to let someone from Arlington uh, build these houses, build these townhomes, uh, and uh, it shouldn't be just this company. Uh, I think we should get local local builders involved and, and not just sell out. Thank you. Um, Next on my list, um, uh, Ms. Medwar. Hi, my name is Linda Medwar. I live at 24 Little John Street, um, right at the hot spot of where everything's going to be projected to happen. So um, I have a couple of, of, of comments and, and questions. So. Um, you know, there's been mention of, of the, the elephant in the room, although I think there are many elephants that are crammed in this room at this point. Um, there's so many issues that I just don't understand how and why this project can even still continue to be thought of or moving in any direction forward. This flood zone, it's wetlands, it's conservation, it's trees, it's, it's, it's this whole, you know, environmental sustainability. So I, I, I don't understand how it's even being thought of as an issue. I mean, aside from the other elephants regarding the traffic issues, the, the, the water increase is just absurd to even think about. On a rainy day, all of the residents in this area are dealing with water in their basement, sump pumps continuously going, not once every year or so, not twice every year, often they're filled. So this whole displacement of water stuff that, that Oak Tree has claimed, they can guarantee there will be no water. I'm not an engineer, but that's absurd. And, and I, I, I'm like sickened by it. I, I don't understand how it can just even be thought of. I'm curious as to um, zoning board members, how many, if any, have been down here, have looked at this area, have driven by, have, have seen when it's flooded, have seen the, the streets, and the water going into in over people's driveways into their basements. That's just on a rainy day, let alone when this whole water gets pushed away from these townhouses and buildings that are allegedly going up. Um, I mean, all of the neighbors in this entire area get water. Um, it, it, I, I just, I don't get it. So like when, when Mr. Mills, I'm sorry, but like you said, I don't have a problem with going up five stories. I, I, we have a problem. I'm not sure where you live, but if you were in this area, I think you would have a big problem with it. Um, and again, so my, I, I am curious if someone could comment how many zoning board members have been in this area and I also agree with Mr. DuPont, who said 
the applicant needs to respond to the express concerns that we have had for a number of years. It just, it just, I feel like we're, we're talking about this and it shouldn't even be at this point. It's absurd. So that's, that's how I feel. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I know in his testimony, Mr. DuPont indicated that he was on site today. Um, I was on site earlier this week. Um, I don't know about the specific schedules for others, but um, I feel fairly confident in saying that you know all members of the board have visited the site on multiple occasions. Um, on a rainy day, on a drizzly. I have never been there on a on a drizzly day. Um, I've I personally have been there on a, a rainy day, but it was a while ago. Um, and you know, it's it's tough to I you know I I can't see into people's houses, so it's tough to know what's going on in people's houses. Um, but you know, we are well aware through you know the, the wide variety of testimony we've received that this is a this is a a predominant concern in this neighborhood, um, and that that is something we are absolutely um, right. But we're still talking about, about townhouses, two story, five story. Yeah. It, it can't. It just can't happen. The the area cannot handle it. It's a wet zone. It's a flood zone. It's whatever you want to call it zone. It's not going to work. And again, I will ask. You know, people that say I I'm, I have no problem with the five-story building. I'm curious, where do you live? Anybody? Anybody? Mr. Mills, where do you live? I'm just curious. If may I answer the question? You may, Mr. Mills. Hey, I live on 28 Mystic Valley Parkway, and I've been an Arlington resident for all my 68 years. My Aunt Margie lives on Dorothy Street, Margie Bow. I am well aware of your areas. The reason I mentioned five stories was as to try and make a, uh, a negotiation, if you will. It shouldn't be one. All right, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Medwar. Thank you. Um, next on my list, um, Ms. Griffith. Uh, a concession that would be preferable to having the apartment house right on the street, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Mills, we're moving on. Thank okay. you, though. Ms. Griffith? Okay. First of all, I really want to thank the Zoning Board of Appeals. They're all volunteers doing a lot of great work for the town, so I don't want to get on anybody's case about that. Um, but several things. Uh, one, townhouses is the only thing that's appropriate to build there. Any sort of big giant building is completely inappropriate. So I've been saying this all along. I think I said it to Gwen at the public meeting at the school, you know, can't you just build those townhouses? You can make millions and, you know, it fits the neighborhood, but a big giant building, putting an access road off of Birch and Edith is the worst thing possible. We have so many commuters that park here. We have all the school, the soccer has just started up. We have all that stuff. I mean, it, it seats down further towards Dorothy Road, but it is crazy here and trying to add more traffic. It's dangerous, it's not appropriate. So, you know, the changes they made back in November made a lot of sense although a big giant building is still completely inappropriate. Uh, but my main two comments I wanted to say was, I, you know, I have a feeling that two things outside of all of our control have conspired to you know, advance this because we have a pandemic, so we don't have the traffic on Lake Street. If any of you ever tried to come down here in the morning between you know, eight and nine o'clock or in the evening between four o'clock and seven o'clock to visit this site in normal times, you would say it's crazy to try to build anything that would add any <laughs> more traffic. It is nuts. And 
you know, maybe not everybody's going to own a car in this complex, but they're going to be ordering online for deliveries. They're going to be ordering their food for delivery. They're going to be Ubering and lifting. There's a lot of traffic that's going to be involved with this. And if you were able, if we weren't having a pandemic, to come down here and ex experience the real situation, you would say it's crazy. The other thing is precipitation ended 2020. We were down over seven inches in precipitation. So far this year, we're down another three or four. We are drought advisories are, are coming up already in the springtime when we're supposed to have all this wet weather. So again, nobody is going to be able to experience the real situation down here with the, with the weather and the, the wetness. You know, my sump pump is usually going off all the time. It's hardly, it's not going off at all. A lot of times I have standing water in the back corner of my yard and a pair of mallard ducks comes every year and swims around. You know, that is not happening this year. You dig down, the ground is close to the surface normally. You're not gonna see that this year. We are down so much precipitation. So unfortunately, you know, anybody, you're not seeing the real situation this particular time, you know, this particular year. And it's just crazy to be thinking about building anything and a big giant building and certainly putting back an egress at the end of Birch and in Edith just creates so much safety problems. And I've already advocated again that I think there needs to be a traffic light on Lake Street at Little John because it's treacherous to try to come out of this neighborhood and turn left onto Lake Street to try to head to Route 2 or whatever. You can't, you can't do it. You know, you can't see because there's so many cars backed up in front of you that you can't see what's coming from the right. So it's so dangerous, you know, but we're in a pandemic, so you guys can't tell, but this, I'm sorry, it's. I, I have a follow-up question for you. Um, you had said at the start that you, you thought the townhouses, townhouses were appropriate. I just wanted to confirm. So there's two, diff two different styles of housing. So one is duplex, which is two houses side by side and then driveway then another two houses in the driveway. And townhouses or townhomes typically is a series of like eight individual buildings stuck together before there's a break. And I just wanted to confirm whether you are saying duplex, meaning you liked sort of what the current pattern is across the street or whether you were welcoming and considering something that might be a little bit longer that would be a little denser. Well, I don't live right there. I'm okay with something that's three stories tall and and just and just on Dorothy Road. <laughs> Nothing in the whole area behind the you know behind it. So you know that's where the problem comes. Just okay. the just number, the size, the number of units, the number of people and tr traffic that that generates. You know that's the problem. Great. <laughs> right. Thank you so and much this area that's impacted because it's so wet you know we just need the smallest area possible impacted and it seems reasonable to me that building some townhomes or town or duplexes or whatever along dorothy road is is reasonable everything else is not <laughs> all right thank you Ms. chapnick Hi, Karen Klein. Thank you for allowing me to make a comment. I am um, speaking, I'm the chair of the Arlington Conservation Commission. I am speaking on that behalf, um, considering the discussion tonight bears directly upon our jurisdictional areas and the comments we have previously presented to the board in numerous comment letters um, and at these hearings. And I just want to um, reiterate that the, um, the change in the plans that was proposed by the applicant, which we're discussing right now, which came about, I think, back in September of 2020, 
greatly reduced the impacts to the resource areas on this site. The resource areas being bordering land subject to flooding, the 100 year floodplain, isolated vegetated wetlands, and the adjacent upland resource areas, which are 100 feet buffer zones um, next to the resource areas. And we were um, pleased, the Conservation Commission was pleased to see the buildings and the actual structures being moved outside of these wetland um, resource areas to minimize the impact on the site. However, we should all remember that there's still significant impact to the floodplain, even with this current building design that is being mitigated, proposed by what we call compensatory flood storage, meaning that the impacts from the buildings in the footprint as it exists now in the plans is being offset, if you will, by flood storage elsewhere on the site. And I will say that if you move the footprint of the buildings, you're going to have a hard time finding other places to put the compensatory flood storage, especially because of the isolated vegetated wetlands that are on the site um, that have been delineated by the applicant as well as um, the data group and the Conservation Commission in the past. So um, we need to understand um, that this, just, this should not be a trade-off. Um, I appreciate the comments of the board previously that said this should not be a trade-off between what is appropriate um, for, um, for, for Dorothy Road versus protecting our wetland resources. And we need to not lose the gains we have made there. And if some progress can be made by changing the massing of the building on Dorothy Road and maintaining the same building footprint, um, that would be acceptable to the commission. If the building footprint is going to increase, that's unacceptable at this time to the Conservation Commission and we would have to reiterate and, and review the substantial impacts that might occur to resource areas as well as floodplain if the building um, footprint is extended down into the resource areas. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jeffrey. Um, Ms. Brown. Hi, Patricia Brown, 49 Mary Street. Um, I've got a couple of questions, but I want to come out first and say I would be all for either duplexes or townhomes, but I'd like to see it as affordable home ownership. So if the townhomes would provide more opportunities for home ownership, then that would be my vote. I do think we need some kind of either townhome or duplex facing Dorothy Road. All right, now my questions. Has the um, 25 foot road width been noted and does that impact it? I'm just gonna put give you all my questions. I'm confused. Are we to a point where this project is gonna go forward and now we're just kind of rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic? Um, third question that I have is what are the legal options for the neighbors if this project goes through? Um, so to address your first question, um, so the, the roadways inside of Lake Street um, are technically listed in the town as having a quote 40 foot right of way. Um, and the, so the 40 feet is the, the land that's under the control of the town, but the actual roadways are 25 feet curve to curve. Um, and that's so my the, front stairs are part of the town property. So the sidewalk the area where the sidewalk would go, that is under the control of the town. It's it would be substantially beyond the sidewalk on both sides. So mm -hmm. the sidewalks aren't that aren't that wide. So we're talking it doesn't matter. It just that's the, the the streets are 25 feet wide, not 40 feet wide. 
Yeah, no, I'm just, the, the, the reason yeah. that the 40-foot the came about is specifically because it's listed as a 40-foot right-of-way in the town, in the town documents. Um, so, so this is not, the, so the process, um, where we are in the process, we are still in the, in the fact-finding portion of the project. We still are in a, an open public hearing where we're taking testimony and we're, we're learning from the, the applicant and from our experts and from the community. Um, how what we want this project to be um, and how we want it to try to craft it as best we can. Um, so it and so at this stage nothing is nothing is fixed nothing is um, nothing is set in stone. Um, the board as after the closing of the public hearing the board then has a, a set period of time for it to render its final decision. But at this point there's it, there's no um, there is no decision in place at this time. Um, and then as far as legal options for neighbors, um, I would like to ask Mr. Haverty if he would mind addressing that question. Um, I don't have town council on today. Mr. Chairman, you're asking me to address what the appeal rates are for neighbors? I believe, Ms. Brown, that your question was what, what options are available to the residents after the rendering of a decision, is that correct? Yes, that's that's correct. So any party that can show that they're aggrieved by the decision of the board has the right to file an appeal pursuant to General Laws Chapter 48, Section 17. That appeal would be submitted either to land court or superior court. And the time for filing is 20 days after the board files its decision with the town court. What constitutes aggrieved? You have to show that you're harmed in a manner that is special and different from the rest of the town. If you are a direct abutter or in a butter to an abutter within 300 feet, then you will have a presumption of standing, um, which means that unless the applicant is able to show for some reason that you, you don't have a harm, um, then you will be presumed to have been harmed by the board's decision. If you are outside of that area, you can still establish that you are aggrieved, but you have to put on affirmative evidence to support that. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Hattery. And thank you, Ms. Brown. Um, Mr. Giannolio. Yes, can you hear me well? I can. Hi, so I'm Diego Giannolio. I live at 85 Dorothy Road. That corresponds to the uh, corner of uh, Little John and Dorothy, so really facing the area that we're talking about. And uh, I just want to share, you know, further express the concerns that we are trying to convey uh, the neighbors about the uh, flooding. I'm moving to this building. This is one of the townhouses built in 2017. And the developer had a good idea of the uh, flooding in the area. So we have a French drainage in the front. We have two sump pumps in the front. We have two sump pumps in the back. So each garage has to have one. In my experience is that those sump pumps run nonstop 24 to 72 hours when it rains. So I moved in again 2017 new construction, 2018. The sump pump in the garage pushed out the uh, pipe from the elbow, so water was actually being pumped inside of my garage because it was so much of the um, stress on the system. 2020, one of the sump pumps in the front broke and the uh, neighbor and I had to replace it. And again, it broke down due to the uh, stress. Mm -hmm. And so everything is done correctly for this townhouse. That's what I'm trying to say. It's just that the uh, stress on the system is so high that the sump pumps really have a hard time keeping up with it. We, I mean, we look at the forecast. When we see a rain, we go outside with the leaf blowers. We try to clear uh, everything we can for drainage. We hear the sump pumps, and then we're ready, you know, to fix them as necessary. Before living, before yeah, living here, I came from the from the uh, city of Boston. So, in my building, in condominium, there were also portable units. I know very well what it means to live in crowded areas. I wouldn't have a problem with that. But 
what we're trying to say is that this is not a pulmonary element and it can host the building <clears throat> of these dimensions. The traffic again would be horrible. It's a corner that doesn't have any access, easy access to Mass Ave and Route 2. You have to have a car. You know, I have kids and to buy a gallon of milk. Either you take the red line and go to some of the stations. There's no way around it. You really need to have a car. So I hope you know that my experience living in this exact corner that you're considering, and I'm actually up here for which I report has been considered. I hope in that my experience can help. Um, you know, as I just, you know, as other uh, call, as other neighbors said, you know, we talked about the Titanic, we talked about elephants in the room. Again, this is what we're trying to say, you know, to really share the concern, not because it's our own idea, but it's a reality. And the flooding and the traffic, mm -hmm. it just, um, it's very bad. So I think I'm borderline. I can still live here in terms of being comfortable with the flooding, but I think that any other construction in the neighborhood, especially going down here, would be, would be really a wrong thing to do. Thank you. You're welcome. Appreciate that. Um, Ms. Light? Hi, Elaine Light, 53 Dorothy Road. I sent an email to the board. I don't see it in the record. So um, I'm just going to read my email to you and then maybe have a couple comments. Once again, Massachusetts is experiencing drought conditions. Mild to severe drought has become more common in the last 10 years. Is this a new normal or merely a swing of the climate change pendulum? I remember the wetter years when my walk to the Alewife tea station became a detour to Mass Ave because the Thorndike field area of the bike trail was underwater and not by inches, but feet. I'm not willing to risk my home and I hope you are not either. I'm attaching Heather Keith Lucas's thoughtful response to the ZBA's draft decision as my endorsement of her arguments. Along with the many, many issues this proposed development raises, I ask you to keep in mind this threat to the very foundation of my house posed by the increased risk of flooding. And my only comment is to draw the line between the drought conditions that were mentioned earlier by uh, a neighbor the flooding that the gentleman is experiencing in a newly constructed top of the line, up it appears, um, ways of dealing with flooding. And it isn't working. And it isn't working in drought years. And it isn't working with climate change where it is now. And we only can fear where it's going. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Ingalls? Yes, hello. My name is Martha hello. Ingalls. I live at 148 Herbert Road. I used to live on Edith Street. Um, it's all well and good to say that the new construction should be in keeping with the style of the neighborhood. And I agree, but there are 12 townhouses across the street from the site on Dorothy Road where the parking is below grade. And we can't have that in the new construction. Nothing in the new construction should be below grade because the neighborhood is already suffering from flooding and we can't make it worse. I like the idea of having townhomes where the parking is behind the house and accessed by uh, a back driveway. I think that would look better than the existing new construction across the street. And that's all I have to say tonight. Thank you, appreciate that. Um, next one is uh, Marcia Nicholas. 
Hello, this is Nicholas Hyde at 152 Lake Street. That's the corner of Lake and Little John. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, for allowing me a chance to speak. Um, I just have a few quick comments. So one is that in a previous correspondence, I had said I might have used the word townhome. And I want to enforce that I meant duplex because my understanding was that the original uh, plan that was drawn up was, you know, duplexes, these you know, buildings that have two domiciles in one building separated by a few feet. And I'm not sure how many other of my neighbors also mean duplex when they say the word town home. For me, unfortunately, in my vernacular, they mean the same thing. But I understand that here, duplex is what I mean to say when I say the word town home. And I, th I think there may be others that think that as well. The other thing I'd just like to say is a extreme heartfelt thanks to uh, both Mr. Hanlon and Mr. DuPont. Uh, I really appreciate what you said, and I feel what you said captures what I wish is what I wish people would say. Uh, so I, I am extremely uh, in support of what you said, and I, I don't know if it was one of the one of Mr. Hanlon or Mr. DuPont who had said this, but somebody had mentioned that this really needs to be a three-way compromise. And that is heartfelt as well. I, I really agree with that, that it's not just about the wetlands. It's not just about what the town needs. Everybody needs to give a little bit. Some will give a lot, uh, but everybody needs to give a little bit. Uh, and so, you know, the three-way compromise, I totally agree. And again, thank you, Mr. DuPont. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Uh, that is all, thank you. Thank you, sir. Is Ovid? Hello, Mr. Chair. My name's Sarah August. I live at 73 Dorothy Road, directly um, across from the development we're discussing here. In the interest of time, I won't reiterate um, all the comments from my neighbours with regards to flooding. Um, and my strong objection against a five-storey dwelling anywhere on the property. I think it's just ridiculous. Um, but the one thing that, or two points that I did want to make is with regards to the flooding, so my driveway, uh, the bottom of my driveway is currently 39 inches uh, below grade of Dorothy Road. I was one of the first townhouses to be built on Dorothy Road uh, and I have flooded my basement and my garage has flooded due to a rise in the um, water level, uh, which you cannot pump out. I mean, this is the ground water level. Um, so this is a uh, hugely concerning to me, as well as I think it was a comment that uh, Miss Chapnick made about um, how the applicant is going to handle uh, the displacement of uh, water, the compensatory flood storage that's going to take into consideration the trees that are going to be removed from the from the property for any development. That's very concerning to me as well. And then secondly, I understand that there is a discrepancy between the town plans and the applicant stamp drawing saying the roads are, or giving the impression the roads are 40 feet wide, whereas in, in fact they are 24 feet wide in the entire neighbourhood, including Kelwin Manor. In fact, Lake Street is only 30 to 34 feet wide. Um, curb to curb, not including the, the, pay, uh, the sidewalks. So my question is, how can construction vehicles access our site when the roads are 24 feet wide? Especially if you are talking about having modular units that are going to come in on flatbed trucks that require trains, you physically will not be able to get them down Lake Street, round the corner, down Little John, and on to Dorothy. So I really do think this is uh, something that needs to be considered um, and do a deep dive. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um. Next, uh, Ms. Murphy. Hi, this is actually Sarah Harris. Florence oh, is right 
Nice to be. You live at 83 Mary Street. So we are approximately two blocks away from the uh, proposed development area. And with regards to the flooding, we have a French drain around our entire basement um, because we have experienced significant flooding in the past. So I can only feel a ton of empathy for my friends and neighbors who live on Dorothy. I've seen their flooding. We can't even walk our dog down Dorothy after it's rained significantly or after there's been a significant snow melt. So please take that into consideration as you move forward with this project. Our, also, our other concern is of course the traffic. Our neighbors know that Florence and I were very instrumental in getting the um, no turn on, uh, no right turn between the hours of seven and nine a.m. and four to seven p.m. because of the significant traffic that we've had down Mary Street. Now you add people who aren't familiar with the neighborhood coming down Little John and we're going to have more accidents. I personally have witnessed two of them at Little John and Mary Street. So these concerns are very valid. I don't think the developers have uh, necessarily considered them all in um, consistency with our, with our neighbors. And we really want to make sure that if anything happens, that it's a safe project. Um, the only thing that makes sense in our minds are the uh, townhomes. Duplexes. We need to, or duplexes, whatever. We need to keep this to a minimum so that we keep the neighborhood safe. There are a lot of kids who live on Dorothy and Mott Street. And if you add all these other cars in, it's going to be very unsafe. Please consider that as you move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it says GM Hakeem. Yep, George Michael Hakeem, uh, 10 Edith Street. Um, I uh, just want to thank uh, the board for the concerns that they raised tonight. I think they uh, uh, capture the spirit of what a lot of us are thinking. And, um, and so I, I appreciate that support. Um, while I am opposed to any large building at all, um, I uh, agree with the previous commenter that you know a little bit of compromise goes a long way. Uh, and so, as many others have said, you know the duplex is fine. You know the Mugars own the land; they want to develop it. If they want to put up the you know the duplexes, make several million dollars, you know that's their right to do so. That keeps with the character of the neighborhood. You know, not too much harm done. Um, and the other thing that that does is that that is that is ownership. Um, you know, uh, rental units only, uh, while they are affordable, they don't really provide a pathway to sustainable uh, long-term ownership and uh, equity building uh, for people um, who are trying to build that equity uh, for their futures. Um, I wanna also address another concern. The project as it currently exists um, has only one entrance and exit, and that's on the corner of Dorothy and Little John. Um, you're putting 179 units in there or some, something around that number. Uh, if a car breaks down or a you know, fire truck pulls in and parks there or whatever happens and blocks that exit, you're creating a serious safety hazard for anybody that lives in there who might have a medical emergency. Um, one entrance and exit for that many um, units really, I mean, it's kind of like a death trap uh, just waiting to happen um, and not to be too dramatic about it. But um, if we're thinking about the worst case scenario um, that we don't want to be negligent. So it, certainly a second exit or entrance, if that project were to go forward, I think has to be required, uh, hopefully out off off route two, um, but certainly not, not just the one. Um, and, uh, and the other thing I just want to address is, um, you know, before anything happens, whether it's the, the building or the duplex, um, as I said, ho hopefully nothing or hopefully just the duplexes, um, I think the, the Mugars have a responsibility to clean up the woods. Um, there's been years of human waste and refuse uh, in those woods from the homeless population who's been living there, um, just waiting to sort of flood down in a big flood into the neighborhoods um, and, and cause serious health hazards for just um, the homeless who live there, but the area residents. Um, so, so I think a, 
if the board is going to accept the project with conditions, one of the conditions has to be that the woods must be cleaned up by the applicants uh, or the owners of the land completely before any ground is broken in any sort of construction. Um, I think that's a, a huge concern and can't, can't be uh, overstated too much. Thank you very much uh, for the time. Thank you. Mr. Moore? Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. Um, I walked the edges of the area um, today that the, the previous speaker was uh, just mentioning. And um, I have to agree, the edges are a mess, uh, full of trash and not been cleaned up. And um, my guess is it's from a number of years. I don't believe it's just from this winter. You can tell that when trash has been hanging out for a while. Um, so the property really hasn't been maintained to date uh, very well, particularly in its edges. And I know there's a, there's a, a serious homeless uh, situation going on. Um, and I guess, We've, we've heard now testimony from, from ho homeowners of uh, the, the homes that are older than the townhouses, which were recently built on um, Dorothy Road, talking about the flooding. We've also heard from homeowners uh, from the townhouses themselves too, I believe, both of which said they experienced flooding from places that were built within the past 10 years. And someone else had mentioned they probably have a state of the art or state of the current art of dealing with uh, flooding. And in one case, the system uh, had, has broken from, from serious stressing and overuse. What I guess I'm not understanding is uh, why building in the, in the swampy area, which is the entire, it looks to me to be the entire plot of land where the development is going to happen, why the expectation is that flooding from building in that area can be mitigated in any useful way, short of moving the water around, you, you can't pump it out of the area, it would just be pumped to a different part of the area, isn't going to impact all the existing homes plus the newer townhomes. I'm wondering if the townhomes that were built in 19, 2017 and around that era time frame required a special permit. Does anyone on the board know that? Um, certainly none of those came before the zoning board. So my sense, I believe that those were designed specifically to just comply with uh, the building code. Okay, First thank you, zoning. thank you, sir. Yeah, so so they comply with all the zoning rules, but look, the new places built there have flooding problems already. Within in that case, five years of having been built, why it is the current developers feel that they can develop a system which will not have flooding of their own property, much less the neighbors. I guess I don't quite understand. Um, the final point I'd like to make is a property ownership is not, does not include the right to develop the property if the property is substandard as this property is. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Ms. Blair? Hello, uh, I'm Brooke Olson Blair. I live at 50 Dorothy Road and um, can definitely comment about the flooding that happens, uh, even with just a very minimal amount of rain. Um, I actually took pictures when we had quarter of an inch and we had some water in our basement um, that I'm going to be attaching to my next email to the ZBA. Um, but I also wanted to add to some of the comments about the Mugar property uh, and the state that it's in. Um, we can just see so much trash from our backyard and last week on two separate instances um, I believe it was Wednesday and Friday, or it was either Wednesday, Friday, Thursday, Saturday, I don't remember. Um, the fire department had been called in twice because the homeless population had um, had fires. One of them had been more of a small campfire, and the other had been a candle that set heads on fire. 
Um, and with all the dry conditions that we've had, there is definitely potential for a fire on that property to really escalate, I think, pretty quickly. Um, especially because there's just all sorts of loose brush and things and all sorts of trash that um, haven't been cleaned up. Uh, so I think that is a real safety issue. And I think that regardless of what happens, that needs to be addressed ASAP. Um, we as neighbors shouldn't have to worry about that potential. And I also don't think, you know, we should have to be worrying that strangers and these homeless population uh, who are often uh, using drugs are, you know, coming through some backyards, coming down Parker Street um, with all these small kids around. Um, and I would say that I am very encouraged by some of the things that the board has said tonight, and we would be fully on board with just the set of duplexes that are there um, that match the neighborhood, especially if they were um, uh, affordable home ownership as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I have four hands up from four people who have spoken before. I just want to make sure, ask quickly, um, those of you with your hands up, do you have a second comment or is your hand just still up from before? Um, so if you, everybody can just check and if you have your hand up. quickly to inquire. Um, I'll just say one more thing to make it clear. And I forgot to say where I live the last time oh. Griffith and I'm at four street. And I just want to make it clear that I think all of us are saying the townhomes or the duplexes or whatever along Dorothy Road is, is okay, but that we're saying no big giant building behind those. That is so not okay. I don't think anybody is saying put the townhouses on Dorothy Road and a giant building behind it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Mr. McKinnon, did you have additional comments? I did, yes. Okay. Uh, Please. Matt McKinnon, Nine Little John Street. Um, I just want to go on record that I've actually been on record with the ZBA. Uh, we had our house renovated uh, around 2016, um, I went in front of the ZBA to approve that renovation. Part of the renovation was to install a basement uh, underneath the, the area we were building. So it was actually a new uh, underground basement foundation. It was not a crawl space. It's uh, not finished. Um, we never had flooding uh, in our house. I was never told about flooding, but we were aware um, you know, every once in a while during a big rainstorm, we would get, you know, significant flooding. Uh, once I put the, um, the underground basement in, I made sure I put a perimeter drain in with a sump pump. And I, um, this is 2016. This thing is constantly running. Uh, you know, there's, there's nothing I can do about it. I, I can't even put the water anywhere because I don't have a backyard to put it into. So now I need to go back and redesign uh, you know, get somebody to come out here and design uh, some sort of catch basin uh, somewhere away from my property to hold this water. Uh, and then once that catch basin fills up, I'm then allowed to tap into the town's uh, storm drain system uh, to catch that overflow. And luckily, I can do that because I'm grandfathered in with the existing foundation I have. But this is going to cost me tens of thousands of dollars to do. And I'm extremely um, angry and scared. And I don't know if you can hear it in my voice because it's shaking, but I am afraid that putting in anything over there, you know, put in the, those duplexes, those townhouses, but the side yards, you know, need to have the side yards because we yeah. need all the, uh, you know, the absorption of water we can get around here. Um, but, you know, let them flood. Just <laughs> let them flood, you know, just make sure that they know they're going to flood because we're all flooding out here. So thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, 
Uh, Ms. Murphy? Who is the second time? Or is your hand just up? Hi. Hi, uh, Sarah Harris and Florence Murphy here again from 83 Mary Street. I did, um, thank you again for your time. We do appreciate um, greatly the amount of time and energy that you've afforded us all um, and that you've put into this uh, project. We, we also have concerns as our neighbors have raised about the uh, trash and the homeless um, that are currently residing in the Mugar uh, wetlands that really needs to be addressed first and foremost as a, a couple of people have raised tonight. Um, I understand that there are hypodermic needles um, in the wetlands. There's a rat infestation and that's a problem. Um, I heard from another neighbor today that somebody raised up your grill and found a rat. So if you go to build and we all get rats because you flush them out, we're not gonna be very happy and we really do not advocate for the use of um, pesticide. So please take all of these things into, into consideration as you move forward and hopefully you just won't do it, but um, thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Callanan. Yeah, uh, th thank you very much for, for uh, hearing me out today. Um, I, I want to echo a I'm lot. Sorry, of can I what... just ask your address, please? Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, John Callanan, 23 Parker Street. Um, I Parker Street on one of the plans, it looks like is the entrance way into one of the into one of the developments. I don't know if that's still on the current plan or not. It's kind of hard to tell because the plans that I've seen, it looks like there have been changes to them. Um, however, I, I wanted to, to kind of echo what some of the neighbors have said, you know, I'm not going to belabor the point. I think you get it pretty loud and clear that we have flooding, serious flooding. Um, I, I wanted to relay a, an experience here, right? I've been here for 35 years. I can't tell you how many times I've gone down Dorothy Road. And when I say flooding, I'm talking about we have garages that are below the houses that are in the basements of the houses and the water level is is level with the street maybe six inches over the curb and that means that their basements are that full with water we're talking feet of water we're not talking about inches or puddles in the bottoms of the basements i've seen washing machines float out of a basement door this is the kind of water and flooding we're talking about. I'm just trying to put it into perspective. Um, I also wanted to comment on the homeless population and the trash that's in the Mugar site right now. Um, there's been a lot of concern that's been raised. Town managers been involved. There are a number of, um, of groups that are getting engaged in terms of um, trying to control what's going on on the property. Uh, the level of debris that's in there, I participated in a cleanup effort back in the fall to help remove some of the debris. We filled up two large dumpsters full of trash, um, buckets full of hypodermic needles. And I'm, I'm here to tell you that we didn't put a scratch in the amount of garbage and trash, human waste, and everything else that you could think of that's in that property. And I 100% think that if there are any construction that's going to be done before it's approved, that site has to be cleaned up and it has to be done so at, at the cost of the property owner. I, I can't believe that the property owner is allowed to continue to have this kind of activity going on on their property and then have the audacity to come before us and say, now we want to develop it. We're not even gonna take care of what we have today. Um, this is their property. They should be held accountable for it. And the townspeople shouldn't be in there cleaning their property up. Um, we've got rats running amok all over the neighborhood. And you, you, if you walk through that, that property, you'll know why. Because there are piles of garbage and plenty of places for these rats to feed and nest. So. This is what I've got to say. Um, I hope you take that into consideration when you're making your decision. Thank you very much. 
Thank you. Um, I guess I had originally said we would be done with this at eight, but I'm gonna, I'll go ahead and extend it to 8.30. Um, try to just quickly pick up people who are still looking to speak for the first time. Um, first would be Ms. Bittaker. Thank you. Um, I think all of my neighbors have raised all of the concerns. And, oh, sorry, um, I just need you to uh, name oh, that. Oh, sorry. Uh, Eva Bittaker, 4 White Street. Um, what I want to make sure is that um, in the decision uh, that the ZBA will publish, uh, that all of the concerns that have been raised uh, are considered in the conditions. Yeah. Um, that the conditions will address uh, the concerns that have been raised with regards to water, with regards to traffic, with regards to health, uh, the construction uh, period, um, and that uh, the last draft decision uh, that we um, saw before the last meeting um, still had a lot of holes um, in addressing many of the issues uh, that came up today and that have come up in the past. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Laura, I apologize, your last name truncate. Uh, Leibensberger, yep. can you hear me? I can, yes, you just uh, address the record, please. Yes, I live at 21 Thorndike Street, up toward the uh, Mass Ave end, Mass Ave. Yep. I'm not subject to flooding and all that knock on wood. But I just want to speak in support of all the people opposing this project because really nobody wants it. And you're just kind of forcing people to bend over backwards to find reasons when really it doesn't benefit anybody. It benefits Mugar. And I know this is pie in the sky, but you know, we spent 300 whatever you know, million on the high school. Why can't we just buy this property take it off everybody's backs. You know, it's not good for anybody who already lives here. And so I just, I just, I'm just want to support the people who spoke in opposition who actually live there. I don't live there, but you know, I'm up on the other end. I just want to speak in support because nobody wants this. Nobody needs it. You know, it's all Mogar making money. So that's all I have to say. Done. Thank you. Um, and then I think the last one, Ms. Griffiths, for a second. I don't have anything else. Sorry. Oh, you don't? Okay. Yeah, I, I guess the hand doesn't go away after you get called on. Sorry about that. I can pull it down for you. Um, there's one hand that has popped back up. Um, Oh, and now it's gone again. Uh, Ms. Kukarski? Hi, um, Anna Kukarski, 34 Mott Street. Um, I want to thank uh, the board for um, your discussion today, especially Mr. DuPont and Mr. Hanlon for um, expressing their views today. Um, I also want to agree with uh, my neighbors who brought up the fact that um, in order to match the rest of the neighborhood, I think only duplexes are reasonable. And um, and if there is something that can be placed behind the duplexes, I think at the same height of the duplexes, it would be the most reasonable, again, if the intention is to match the rest of the neighborhood. Um, my other comment is about the traffic, which I don't feel like has been significantly uh, sufficiently addressed. Um, because there will be an increase of 70% of households with the addition of this 176 unit building, um, you know, there will be an increase in traffic. There'll be um, 300, around 300 adults that would move into this building. And although not everyone will use a car, as it has been mentioned before, they will be doing car shares. They'll be, you know, uh, they will be using vehicles because there's no way 
to do anything from this location without using a vehicle. And, uh, you know, I've definitely tried. Uh, and so there's going to be a significant increase in traffic. So I have two questions for this. One is um, the original proposal included a separate um, exit to Route 2. I know this was dismissed, but now that we are con reconsidering things brought up in the original proposal, which was approved by Mass Housing, can that uh, in any way, is that any way possible still to have another egress off of Route 2 um, from their proposed um, complex? And then my second question is more personal question for the neighborhood and for the future tenants in the neighborhood who will see a 70% increase in the neighborhood and 300 adults using cars. If should God forbid one of our children um, are hit by the increased amount of traffic, what is the legal process by which we can prove um, the liability that is from this, in this approved increase of the cars in our neighborhood? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. With that, I'm going to go ahead and close public comment, but we definitely have a few questions that were raised that I do want to double back on. Um, so the first is the, re the recurring, excuse me, the recurring question of access from Route 2. Um, Ms. Keeper, I believe you guys have pursued this with with Mass DOT, who owns the property and owns the rights to the connections, um, is that correct? Um, so I, I I don't know if um, Vanessa, um, if Scott Thornton may be the better um, person to respond to it, but it, it does not appear that there's going to be an ability to come in from Route Two. So. You know, when this was initially proposed back in, in 2015, when we were going for project eligibility, that was the hope, but it doesn't appear that that's a viable. Okay. Um, uh, Mr. Lucas, do you have any? Or Mr. Thornton, do either of you have any specific? Yeah, I, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, um, as as Attorney Kiefer mentioned, the um, the it, the, the access from Route 2 is no longer uh, contemplated. There are a number of operational concerns uh, associated with that type of connection. There's a there's um, there's parameters related to weaving and merging criteria that would not be able to be met. Um, you'd have traffic that would be that would be uh, looking to exit onto Route 2 at the same time that there'd be traffic that would be looking to um, uh, exit from Route 2 onto Lake Street. So uh, it was always, I think, sort of a, um, I think it was always a problematic uh, access scenario, uh, looking at access from Route 2. And uh, there's a number of, of logistical and, and permitting issues and and operational issues as well that that make it so it would not be um, it would it would not be uh, considered a, a good design to have that type of access. So I just want to clarify that the plan going forward for traffic then is just based on the pandemic traffic studies, which is you know is hoped by the architects to continue at this pace. So the, 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 the public, I, I appreciate your, your follow-up question, but the public comment period is closed. And I, I do need to ask you to, to not jump on, jump in if you would please not do so. Um, so I don't know, Mr. Thornton, if you could just spend a, you know, just a, a quick couple of minutes to explain the methodology for how we have the, um, the traffic counts that that you have provided and that have been corroborated uh, by the by the board's peer review. Yeah, sure. So so we did collect some traffic volumes um, at the at the intersections associated with the neighborhood, um, and then we had historic. So those were conducted uh, in 2020 during pandemic uh, time periods because there was no historic data that was available. Uh, that we could use, um, but then those those traffic volumes were adjusted using 
current or, or sorry, using traffic volumes uh, historic to the area that were pre-pandemic conditions. Uh, we we're also looking at, uh, uh, traf at permanent traffic count data or continuous uh, traffic count data uh, provided by uh, MassDOT in order to look at conditions and traffic volume adjustment factors from conditions prior to the, to the COVID pandemic uh, and how those adjustment factors would be applied to, to, the, um, to the traffic volumes to, to adjust them both for a seasonal consideration for, um, for historic condition, for uh, time, lapse of time, and also if needed for the, uh, for the effects of the pandemic. Um, and again, this is something that we've, we worked out. There's, there's policies that are developed by Mass DOT uh, for, for adjustment of traffic volumes in pandemic conditions. And uh, we worked with the town's peer consultant on the adjustment of the traffic volumes and they are in agreement that the volumes were adjusted to present a realistic scenario. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hamlin. I just wonder for the record if Mr. Lucas can comment on it too. I know that Mr. Thornton has, has discussed what the peer reviewer's position is, but it would be helpful, I think, on the record to have Mr. Lucas's view from Mr. Lucas. Mr. Lucas? Would be, I would be happy to. Um, would reiterate what Mr. Thornton said. The, the, study, the study was done with a combination of um, data that was collected prior to the prior to the pandemic that was adjusted based on um, both industry standard and MassDOT specific guidelines, looking at <clears throat> uh, continuous counting stations to um, to determine factors for adjustment to current conditions, and then there was some data that was collected um, during during the pandemic um, where there were additional counts that were necessary based on preliminary peer review comments and board comments, and th those were adjusted. So um, overall, the study and the traffic volumes and the and the assumptions based on those traffic volumes con contained in the study um, are based on a pre-pandemic condition um, using the data that was collected. Overall, as an industry, although there's great uncertainty as to what's going to happen as a result of the pandemic, it may, it's, it's prudent to designed to a pre-pandemic condition, assuming that there will be a return to normal of what traffic conditions existed um, before the pandemic. And so there have been some public comments about um, there's less traffic now on Lake Street. And um, when it comes back, the study is entirely based on that pre-pandemic condition that the, that the public describes. Mr. Chairman, if I could ask one other question. Yes, Mr. Hanlon. M Mr. Lucas, the, if, if I remember from reading through the tables that are included in, in the applicant study and that, uh, and that you've looked at, um, the description of the situation that exists on Lake Street at the signalized and unsignalized intersections does not it was, would it be fair to say it does not exactly paint a rosy picture of what the traffic is, that those traffic levels are do represent a, a seriously problematic traffic situation. We all agree on that, is that correct? Uh, th that's, that's correct. We're looking at, you know, um, level of service and delay calculations that show existing faults in the traffic network on, along Lake Street. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Thank you, Mr. Lucas, and Mr. Thornton as well. Um, another question that has been raised a couple of times, um, and I'm, I'll direct this to Ms. Kiefer and ask her to, to find the appropriate person, um, is this question of the constructability and the ability to bring um, the, the boxes, which are you know, 13 feet wide, 11 feet tall, and 62 feet long, the ability to maneuver those 
to the project site. Has anyone done a study to confirm that it is actually possible to move um, something this large into those positions? I would probably defer back to, to Scott again. Um, I know that he had been working with the, um, some of the manufacturers and, and looking at the routes and how that would go forward. So, um, I, I, and Scott, if you wanna pull in anyone else, but probably you're the best point person to initially address that question. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, we did work with, um, with, with a, a couple of uh, potential um, manufacturers of the, uh, of the, of the residential modules. And we, um, we do have some information related to, or they provided some information related to the size of the modules and the, um, the types of vehicles that, that would be needed to bring, um, the modules to the, uh, to the site. And uh, we did perform some, um, uh, some um, vehicle circulation studies that looked at uh, the, the path that, the, that a module truck would take, a delivery, a delivery vehicle would take coming in from Route 2 onto Lake Street, uh, traversing down Little John, uh, to into the site at the end of Dorothy, uh, at the end of Dorothy Road, and um, and at that point the the vehicle would be able to pull into into a portion of the site, be unloaded, and then exit back out onto Dorothy and then out onto Lake Street. Uh, as was mentioned previously, um, we did program the width. Or as was mentioned previously, North, uh, Little John Street is is between 24 and 25 feet wide. Uh, we did program that width into those studies, and we found that the vehicles were still able to make the turn from Lake Street onto Little John, and um, and also uh, exiting the move, exiting the neighborhood, traveling back out Little John onto Lake Street. Um, we anticipate that uh, these during the period of, um, of when these modules would be delivered to the site, there would be police officer details at a few key intersections, uh, particularly Lake Street and Little John Street, um, probably, uh, and also uh, Dorothy Road and Little John Street, so that the, um, uh, to ensure that there would be um, no pedestrians, bicyclists, uh, children, anyone uh, in the area when the vehicles would be uh, coming to the site. We'd also have uh, flaggers associated with the contractors to temporarily uh, stop vehicles uh, coming up from, uh, from Mary Street and Mott Street just for the delivery vehicle to enter the site. Um, and then we, we would probably have or look to uh, work with the town and the neighborhood on um, ensuring um, some uh, or working to develop some uh, uh, construction management plan that would include some temporary parking restrictions on Little John Street, but only during the period that uh, we would see that the deliveries of these modules would take place. And we would try to, to the extent possible, we would try to schedule them off peak. It would when you say off-peak, are you talking sort of middle of day, or are you talking evenings, or? No, no, we're, t we're talking middle of day. And just to, just to clarify, so the, the route back to Route 2, would that go up Little John, or would that go down Dorothy to the next street and out? No, no, we would assume it would, it would just go back out Little John. Okay. We wouldn't, we wouldn't have the trucks coming um, at the entering and exiting at the same time. Um, you know, one truck uh, on, on Little John at any one time. Those were the questions that I had noted um, going through the public 
comments. Um, are there, were there other questions identified? Uh, Mr. Revelak? Yes. Uh, one of the things that uh, was mentioned a few times was owner occupied uh, affordable units rather than rentals. And I guess this is probably going to be a question for Mr. Haverty. Um, let's say a, a, an, a household buys a, you know, a, a, an affordable townhome. Um, so based on, you know, what's, what would, um, based on a price that would be non-housing burden to someone making 80% of the area median income, they'll pay maybe $350,000. Now that household later goes to sell the property, would they be selling it for market rate or would they also be selling it at an affordable rate? So they would still have to sell it at the affordable rate. Mm -hmm. um, so the, basically- the, affo the affordable price will change over time depending mm -hmm. on um, you know, the increase in, in the 80 percentile income level, it will change based upon interest rates. Um, so they could sell it at a higher price mm -hmm. than what they purchased it for, but it, they are not going to make the same increase that an unrestricted uh, housing owner would be able to make. Okay, it would effectively be a combination of interest rates and whatever, um, you know, whatever, you know, per regional income is you know in other words uh non-housing burden to a household who at the time of sale is making 80 percent of the area median income right it, and it's someone not making um sorry not spending more than 30 percent of their income on housing any further mr Revelak? nothing further thank you mr chair thank you mr hanlon um, the, there was one other question that had to do with uh, the ingress and egress of the um, of the uh, trucks during construction that had to do with uh, the street trees that exist. And I just want for the record for Mr. Thornton to address whether those have been taken into account, whether there are difficulties that might be encountered bringing this heavy equipment in uh in light of the trees that exist along the relevant streets so uh it's a great question and there are definitely some trees particularly the, there's one at the um at the intersection of little john and dorothy uh that uh definitely um um you know Im impinges or 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 uh, is, is growing out into and over the roadway. Um, and that's one of the reasons why uh, the path that we've chosen for the vehicles to get to the site uh, steers clear of that, uh, of that tree um, so that there's, there would be a, a staging area that would be set up for the trucks to pull into the site away from, from that tree. Um, and then when they, when they um, when they exit the site, they will be backing up um, into the site and then um, and then continuing back out onto Little John. Um, I I can't tell you that we looked at each and every uh, single tree, uh, but um, during the you know as as part of a as part of a construction management plan where the uh, which would be worked out with with town staff and uh, the contractors and bringing materials to the site, uh, there would there would be measures taken to to avoid the to the extent possible some of those trees um, that or the, the the canopies of some of those trees that are out or growing out into uh, the streets. I think if the if the if the trucks are able to uh, Come up the middle of Little John Street. They can they can avoid most of the um, uh, most of the contact, uh, the type of damaging contact that would occur from them riding right along along the side of the of the. But again, that's 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 something that would be worked out uh, with the with the development of the construction management plan and and town staff. 
Um, do you, just a quick follow up on that. Do you know what the between the 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 load and the truck what the height of the vehicle is when it's loaded? Uh, well, it's it should be it should be below fourteen feet. It, it's not allowed to be it's not allowed to be higher than that on on to be on Massachusetts roadways. Thank you for that, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Dupont. So I just wanted to follow up to um, if someone could remind us what is the period of time over which this construction uh, would carry on and on how many how many trips uh, with these modules would there be per day or in total, whichever is the easiest to give over that period of time. Right, so so I can give a I can give a quick answer, and then maybe uh, if if Art uh, is available, he could he could chime in with some more details. And 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 to some extent, um, you know, we we're we've been working with contractors and manufacturers that have uh, that that may be selected, but. Uh, but but no one has been selected, and therefore these plans are are, um, are are haven't been definitively nailed down yet. Uh, but but I believe the 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 module total module number was somewhere between 250 and 290 um, uh, modules will be brought to the site, and we had done some some um, some math related to. Uh, bringing bringing those in uh, over the course of about a, a about a six week period, um, that that worked out to be it, so it would it would be close to um, um, I think it would be a, a, a truck or two of the modules would be brought in uh, every hour between uh, say nine and three uh, Monday through Friday, uh, so that worked out to be somewhere around a, a six week period. Um, and that would get all the all the modules onto the site. Now we haven't again we haven't gone into into the detail with the contractors to determine if that's the if that's the right schedule. But um, but but we think that that's a, a that's a reasonable estimate for how long it'll take for the modules to be delivered to the site. I don't know if Art has any other follow up for that. Here. There yeah. we are. Uh, can you hear me? We can. Okay. They, they said around 10, uh, 10 modules per day. So that's fairly consistent. And um, the, uh, the trucking to the site is also consistent because it's coming from a staging area that might be two or three miles away. So they, uh, uh, you know, they can maintain a fairly predictable flow of modules that isn't subject to uh, delays or anything like that. And uh, it really is fairly predictable and obviously will be worked out uh, with the building department in, in Arlington uh, as to how that all work. And I, Scott did a good job of explaining there would be uh, these details and uh, uh, there'd be one box delivered at, at each time. I think it's all coordinated by, uh, they all coordinate because they all have cell phones and directors and uh, you know it, it's uh, it works very well it works very well in fact uh, one of the reasons we were we won a competition to do a project in uh, Newton is that the uh, uh, the city was very interested in, in the um, ability to, to, to get the pain of construction out of the neighborhood as quickly as possible which of course is an advantage in modules um, so other than that I think Scott did a good job of a uh, follow up, Mr. Chairman. No, please, Mr. So, um, in in terms of the uh, entering from Lake Street and then exiting back out onto Lake Street, with whatever the truck is that's being used to carry the modules, is that in uh, is that going to be an unimpeded turn, so that once traffic is clear, say they're on Little John and they're turning onto Lake. Uh, that they can just make that turn just freely, or does it have to 
require some sort of a two point turn or three point turn or something like that. Yeah, no, it's it's a it is a unimpeded. Uh, the, the, the trailer, um, the trailer for, for the module has, um, it has a large, it has a longer overhang, but it has, um, the, 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 this, the wheelbase is fairly short. So it makes the, it makes the trailer, um, it makes the trailer pretty maneuverable. And, you know, we, we would anticipate that, um, the, the, that there'd be sort of a clear zone that would be set up uh, on Lake Street so that the police details would, would know where to stop the traffic on Lake Street so that the truck could exit out of, uh, out of Little John. But, but we're showing that the truck doesn't go up onto the, uh, onto to the curb or, or cross over onto onto property, it stays it stays within the curb to curb dimensions of, of Lake Street and Little John. Is that true coming into Little John as well? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yep. Other questions from the board at this point? Chairman? Mr. Hanlon? Um, so this is only switching to Sorry, I'm having trouble hearing you. I'm sorry, I'm switching to a different subject matter. The, we had a, heard a lot about flooding, we always do, and everyone knows that there's serious flooding problems here. And both in, engineers, our engineers from Beta and uh, Mr. Hessian's people have been studying that. Um, and it's complicated and you have to read through a lot of materials that a lot of which is is sort of technical back and forth between highly educated and experienced people and i wonder if it's possible to just say in a in in a sentence or a paragraph why is it that we can be confident or that the applicant or are you confident and if so why that the construction of a project along the lines that you've proposed will not make the flooding for the neighbors worse. Mr. Hefton? Mr. Chairman, um, in, a, in a sentence, <laughs> Uh, Mr. Hanlon's uh, put a challenge out there to me. Um, a lot of what has been discussed with some of the um, experiences the neighbors live with, um, some of the newer duplex homes directly across Dorothy Street with garages under um, with those driveways sloping steeply down from uh, Dorothy uh, down into the garage, at the, which is at the same elevation of the basement. Um, and al also the acknowledgement of the need for um, foundation drainage systems, French drains um, and sump pumps. You know, it's one thing that we have discussed incorporating into the design, uh, into the architectural design, are measures that will prevent um, floodwaters or, or just stormwater runoff from getting down, you know, the driveway, if you will, into the garage level. Um, we've talked about incorporating similar to, you know, the homes in the neighborhood, the newer homes in the neighborhood. Um, and some of the retro, call them retrofits to some of the older homes in the neighborhood, uh, foundation drainage systems, French drains, and sump pump systems, which whenever you build in the groundwater, you, you know, that has to all be considered in the design. What 
what this project is doing is not um it's not in well it it's not really changing i know there's been discussion of the multifamily building acting as a dam um you know groundwater flows to the path of least resistance and, and we've talked a little bit about some of the foundation drainage systems that will really allow and enhance that existing groundwater to follow its normal path of travel, which is towards the south, towards Alewife Brook. Um, some of what we've discussed tonight also is the potential modification of the development program to re, uh, reintroduce the townhomes again to move the multifamily building further back from Dorothy Road, which is further away from those adjacent uh, single family and, and duplex neighbors. And um, and sorry, I, I lost my <laughs> train of thought there for a second. Oh, and allow uh, for you know the flow of both surface water and groundwater um, in the areas between the, the, the potential duplex units. Um, you know, one other thing that I wanted to mention too is just to reiterate, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about this project being, um, you know, built in a swamp or in the wetlands. And it, it has been acknowledged also uh, by several of the board members that, you know, the, the project has done a lot since, you know, I think back September of 2020 to really be cognizant of the wetland resource areas on site and to avoid or minimize impacts. And the, the development on this site is really limited to um, upland areas significantly outside of any wetland resource areas, predominantly outside of the 100 foot buffer um, and locally regulated ARA um, and with just limited impacts to the um, to the to the floodplain, but with that floodplain providing a two to one compensatory storage volume um, as required by the you know uh, Arlington Wetland regulations, um, and it's also important to note that that compensatory storage volume is being provided in what is um, today. Uh, not floodplain, nor uh, wetland resource areas. Up, in other words, upland areas. So that was not a single sentence, and it was probably a bit of a run-on paragraph. Uh, but I hope that um, responds to your question, Mr. Hanlon. Okay. As a as a follow-up to that question, um, several of the the residents spoke of. Um, high groundwater being a contributing factor to the the issues they're having in their basements and the the inability to sort of you know as they say sort of pump their way out of it. Um, so is so how would the building address that as as it's currently conceived, where the, the it appears that the lowest level of the garage is below. Um, what is considered the groundwater level. So again, um, you know, the design of the building foundation, the, the garage foundation for that, you know, for that portion of the garage that's in the, in the groundwater table, um, you know, it will be fully waterproofed uh, to prevent groundwater seepage into the garage level. Um, for, for stormwater, groundwater, or just snow melt or runoff uh, in a garage that, that um, is brought in by vehicles using the garage, um, that water will be pumped uh, first filtered through an oil grit separator and then pumped to the municipal sewer system. Thank you. Mr. Mills? <coughs> Yes, sir, Mr. Chair. 
I have a, a question to that same gentleman. Um, again, I brought up the point that this long building will act like a dam, and you pretty much said it wouldn't. Uh, being that it extends down into the water table, and water would like to find its path of least resistance. When there was no foundation there, there was no resistance. Now you're putting something in the path. So how do you explain that this should not cause a change? Again, um, it, it will be incorporated into the foundation um, design to waterproof the foundation. When you install a French drain around a building foundation. Excuse me, sir. I'm not talking about water going into your foundation. I'm talking about water changes in the water table around it. <clears throat> and, and water that, wants to flow south through your site. You're putting a dam basically east west. So water's going to have to run around either area. Intuitively to me, it sounds like you're going to be making an impediment to the flow, which is going to make the local water table worse. If you could explain how you're going to attack that problem. Uh, I think the locals would greatly appreciate it. Again, I, I was responding to, you know, not the garage, water getting into the garage. It was um, allowing that groundwater to travel with ease around the new building foundation. The backfill will be more um, conducive to water flow than, than the existing earth material that's there today. And that's what I meant, finding the path of least resistance. A very high um, permeable backfill material, gravel adjacent to that foundation wall, the water will find its way to that and it will have the easiest path of travel to flow kind of east and west on the front, the north side of the building foundation and then south along the east and west foundation walls. Excuse me. How thick will this back layer be of permeable fill? I would think it would have to be considerable. It's, you know, the backfill um, probably at the base of the foundation is going to be, probably need to be on the order of, um, you know, five feet in width around the building. And then if there's, the, the other thing is, assuming there's a uh, perimeter drain system installed that will be sized appropriately, that's a pipe. So it's not just water traveling through gravel, it's water through in a, flowing through a, you know, free flowing pipe to divert that water around the building to the south to its normal path of travel. Excuse me, I missed um, a minute or two of that. I think I have a bad connection. You're explaining about how it was going to go around either side. And what, did you mention something about a pipeline, sir? The Yes, I did. The foundation drainage system will likely, in addition to the gravel backfill, um, include you know a found, foundation drainage system similar to some of the French drains that were mentioned by some of the, the, the neighbors tonight, um, that that French drain, that pipe will even be a less restrictive path of travel than the gravel backfill itself. So water will migrate through the ground to the gravel, to that pipe and flow east, west around the front of the building, north side of the building, down the east and west sides, ultimately, discharging to the south towards the Alewife Brook. Thank you for your explanation, sir. Thank I you. hope your engineers are correct in their assessment. Mr. Revelak. I have a slightly related question. Um, this is something I believe we discussed a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it's been, I'm reminded of it by the conversation we're having and also by one of the correspondents from the, um, you know, from, uh, from the neighbors. So with us uh, at a prior meeting, um, I think we had broached the idea of basically taking the garage floor and bringing it up 
some amount and bringing the whole bringing the whole entire building up in 3d space uh okay. you know for the purpose of you know clearing the water table and providing less of a less less possibility for impediment um and possibly reducing the amount of excavation that would be necessary uh, when constructing the foundation i was wondering if that received any further consideration or um you know or if uh, it got a thumbs down yeah um i wasn't sure if gwen was gonna speak to that but i, I can um this is john hessian again i can speak to that um we did we did look at that we did discuss that um in one of our responses to um the town engineer and or beta peer review um, letters, we made a commitment to go back out and in further investigate the groundwater elevations during, you know, a high groundwater season. So it, I, I guess I would say, uh, you know, a fair response to that would be that, you know, we kind of tabled that discussion until we had better information on the groundwater table or or either confirmatory information or or updated information it it didn't seem prudent to raise the building and then and then go out and find out the groundwater elevation is um you know a little higher than what we what was originally expected uh, but i think that is something that is definitely uh that can be looked at and especially in light of potentially looking at some site plan changes based on uh, the, the conversation tonight regarding the the uh, the change in the building program. Thank you. Much. Thank you very much, Mr. Hesh. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, the, Mr. Okay. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Hanlon. <clears throat> um, in, in the course of the well, let me just do two things. One be, before I forget, um, I wanted to thank Ms. Keith Lucas for the very interesting paper that she submitted to us. We haven't gone into it in nearly as much detail as we will over the next few days as we get a chance to uh, uh, as we get a chance to uh, carefully look at what she has said about the individual conditions and and what how what the responses might be and, and what we can take from that. But it's an extremely constructive approach and it's very useful in, as we try to make the conditions and the decision as good as it can be before we make a decision as to whether it's good enough for us to make the conclusion we have to make at the end as to whether the local concerns have been met. So I'm not sure whether she's on this call or not, but others who have been working with her are. And I just want, want to, for the record, to say that, that I'm grateful to that. Um, the specific question I wanted to ask has, I guess it may be for Mr. Thornton and Mr. Lucas. Um, it's been pointed out that we, that there's a potential danger when you have only a single access of this kind that under circumstances where that single, single access is blocked for some reason. And in this neighborhood, there are lots of wet reasons why it might get blocked, um, that you then have a dangerous situation in case an emergency develops. Uh, and I just wanted to, to, to know uh, how the applicant is, is is dealing with that? Is there an alternative way in an emergency of getting people out of the site and to the and to the help that they need? Is is how how is that issue being addressed? I'm not sure. So uh, so that's a good question. And um, typically, when we look at access for uh, for complexes like this, we look at um, that, that has one access point. We look at uh, certain guidelines, um, uh, ITE guidelines, uh, uh, NFPA guidelines for, for emergency vehicles and things. And 
And given that we have we have such a short distance from where uh, the the streets and the the the, the location or the the ability to access two separate streets is from where the where the uh, the garage and the access to the development is. Uh, we're not concerned with um, with with emergency access and egress. Um, there's there's the ability to the, the the driveway is wide enough to accommodate uh, flow. If for instance there was there was a an accident or, or something blocking um, um, blocking the, the drive aisle. Um, it's it's wide enough that uh, the vehicles would be able to bypass uh, a, a, a parked vehicle along the along the driveway, and then there's access out to either Dorothy Road or to Little John. Um, this is something that we would uh, also review with. Uh, the, the fire department to make sure that they're they they don't have any uh, concerns with it as well. Um, so I don't know if if Mr. Lucas has a has an opinion on that as well. But but again, we're 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 not concerned with the um, with the access as it's planned. Yeah, I would echo that. There the the driveway with the courtyard entrance in the front of the building would even if there was a blockage of the the main driveway with the garage access there would still be vehicle access to the front of the building there would still be emergency access via dorothy road if for some reason little john or the the main site entrance was blocked so you know for the question of in the case of an emergency um you know the building is served by the street network both with the driveway opposite Little John Street and a building frontage on um, Dorothy Road. And as Mr. Thornton stated, if there was a breakdown or an accident, you know, anything's possible, but if there was a breakdown or an accident, the driveway is of a sufficient width that, that to allow um, vehicles to pass one another. So in the case of a stopped or a broken down vehicle, there, there would still likely be an ability for other vehicles to get around it. Thank you both. Um, so to follow up to an earlier question that I'd like to um, direct to Mr. Haverty's, the, the question of the, the units that would be on Dorothy Road, uh, rental versus ownership. Um, the decision in regards to that question, that rests solely with the applicant, is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Okay. Can be uh, a project that is uh, has a portion that's rental and a portion that is home ownership. That is not something that is unheard of as part of the Chapter Forty B process. But the but the board is not allowed to dictate the ownership category. Correct. Thank you. Other questions at this time from the board? Okay, so, um, so, so based on the, the initial request from the board this evening and the, the commentary that's been received both from the board and from, um, from the residents and in response to the the questions and responses from uh, from the applicant and the board's peer review consultant. Um, I guess this is a question back to the applicant. Does this does this provide you with sufficient guidance in regards to what what sort of a project the board um, and the residents are looking for at this stage, or is there additional information you? would like to have from us at this time. I think, uh, Stephanie, why don't you go ahead? But I just did want to say that the uh, from the owner's side that, uh, and I, I'd like, love to have Stephanie get into this. What, what would the process be uh, in terms of uh, working toward 
we've heard what's said and obviously uh, appreciate it very much. And I, I think that there's a degree of clarity. So we'll have to uh, scratch our heads on that. Um, but I don't understand the process. So Stephanie, why don't you take over? And comment. Thank you, Art. I was uh, I was just going to say that um, we appreciate the the input that we've received um, from the board um, together with the, the the public comment that has been received, and I think that we're going to need to meet as a team to evaluate um, you know the, the request to to consider this. Um, but in terms of in terms of a, a process, um, my suggestion is probably. Um, we would want at least a week just to discuss internally. Um, again, as you can appreciate, there's um, there's a number of considerations to take into account. You know, not the least of which is, is the engineering aspect of it. Um, and then I think, um, Mr. Klein, if, if you would consider this, that uh, we schedule a time frame that we just you know let you know what our thoughts are, and then if we seek to advance a, a revision. Um, maybe a quick coordination call to figure out what the, what the timing would be before we can get something um, to the board, even at a preliminary stage. And then secondly, if the decision is that um, we should keep with the current program um, to get us back on track to review uh, mm -hmm. the, the revisions there. So um, just, I, I guess I'll put this out to my team first, um, whether or not we think that something along the lines of, of a week, um, a week to 10 days is enough time to, for us to coordinate and uh, get back in touch with the board. I think that sounds uh, okay, Stephanie, thank you. Boy, with us. Uh, John, if I could just ask you quickly, because I don't want to um, impinge too much on you. If, if that's too tight of a time frame. No, uh, Stephanie, I, I think um, that week to 10 days um, should be adequate to to uh, kind of test this out and um, obviously not have fully engineered uh, redesigned plans, but um, to be able to discuss the, the concept of the changes potential changes. So with that said, Mr. Chairman, I, I would potentially suggest today's the eighth. Yeah. Um, and I, I think we were contemplating the next hearing would be on the 20th. 20th. So if, if we could get back to the board by um, the uh, 17th, I'm not even certain what day of the week that is actually. 18, 19, 18, 17, 16 will be a Friday, I believe. Okay. Uh, is that right? I think so. The 19th is the Monday. So oh, you're right. You're right. Okay. So, so that gives us, right. That would give us about nine days. So if we were able to get back to the board by the end of next week, that would be, um, we would have a, a sense of whether or not, or, or what a hearing would look like on the 20th. That'd be great. Well, I think just to echo, uh, this is Arthur again, what uh, John just said, this would be on the level of concepts. Oh, absolutely. Not well worked out drawings. Absolutely. I mean, we're at this state, you know, we're really looking to get a sense as to, you know, is this something that that is pursuable? Or is this, or is this, you know, something that, that is not going to, not going to fly? And I think that, you know, if we can get that kind of a decision in a week or 10 days, I think that's, that would be extremely helpful. All right. Any further further questions from either from the, the applicant or from the board? No, sir. I am seeing none. All right. Well, then, with that, this is a very, very constructive meeting. Um, so I think we will. I will ask for a motion to continue um, the hearing until 
Tuesday, April 20th. Um, I guess we should keep 6.30 p.m. is probably a good idea. So um, can I have a motion to continue until Tuesday, April 20th at 6.30 p.m.? So moved. So moved, Mr. Hamlin. A second. second. Thank you, Mr. Mills. A quick vote of the board, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Mills. Aye. Mr. O'Rourke. Aye. Mr. Ford. Aye. And Mr. Revelack. Aye. And the chair votes aye. So with that and with uh, great thanks to everyone for their uh, their participation this evening, we are continued on this matter. Um, so thank you all for your participation in tonight's meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. Appreciate everyone's patience throughout the meeting. Especially wish to thank uh, Ben Lee for his assistance in preparing for and hosting this online meeting. Uh, please note the purpose of the board's recording the meeting is to ensure the creation of an accurate record of its proceedings. It's our understanding the recording will be transferred to ACMI. Um, it will be available on demand at ACMI.tv, probably not within the coming days, but probably within a week or so. Um, if anyone has comments or recommendations, please send them via email to zba at town.arlington.ma.us. That email address is also listed on the Zoning Board of Appeals website. Uh, to conclude tonight's meeting, I would ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. So moved, Mr. Hamlin. Second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Mills. All board members in favor of adjournment, please say aye. 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 All opposed? The board is adjourned. Thank you all so very much for your participation and all your efforts this evening. It's greatly appreciated. Thank you, Good night. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Ms. Keefer.